Hey Siri, can you call Bill Clinton? No. Bye Siri. It was another Saturday in Brooklyn. I was supposed to be writing a lesson. And instead, I was deep down a YouTube rabbit hole with writer's block. Maybe I need to be doing reaction videos to reaction videos. Then a comment on one of my videos brought me back. Is your channel based on the Pareto 80-20 rule? And if so, can you explain how that applies to drumming? Got me pretty much between the eyes. It's been so long since I discussed the 80-20 rule, I pretty much assumed everyone knew about it. And I've talked about the key insights that led to my leaps forward that inspired me to start this channel, but mostly in emails. And it occurred to me that there's a direct dovetail between the topics I've been addressing lately. Is talent something we're born with? Do we overrate ourselves, especially when we're bad at something? Even my story arc in the How to Get Gigs lesson. So let's talk about it. It all comes down to a single question. Is all drum practice created equal? Let's get into the life experiences that led me to that question. First, the anecdotal. I went to music school, and in music school, it's tough to tell what practice is doing for everyone. Everybody's practicing hard. Everybody's taking lessons and playing in groups. Everybody's pretty much getting better. It wasn't until a few years out of music school when I got tired of constantly arguing with my apartment superintendent about what hours I could practice drums that I finally moved into one of New York's ubiquitous shared public practice spaces. And shared music spaces in NYC are a democratizing force. One thing you realize in a hurry is that music school kids are a small minority of all the people playing music in New York. A rounding error. So you'd expect to see a lot of hobbyists rehearsing once a week just for the pleasure music gives them. And there's that to be sure. But there was also another category. People practicing four to five hours a day. And as the years wore on, I began to notice some musicians I heard through the door or just by walking down the hallway would be practicing the same thing every day for years on end. and. How do I put this delicately? Sounding basically the same in year three as they did in year zero. So that was big insight number one. It's possible to practice a lot and not get discernibly better. And I want to be clear about one thing. I'm not judging or trying to cast aspersions. As I'll cover in a minute, and as I discovered, I was actually suffering from the same thing. So we can practice a lot and not get any better? But that's at odds with Anders Ericsson and the 10,000 hour rule, right? Nope. Erickson himself says there's a big difference between crap practice and what he calls deliberate practice. More on this later on, but let's get into the 80-20 principle a little. Once I realized that all practice wasn't created equal, it followed that some things you could practice must have a really big effect, others a smaller one, and still others a practically nil effect. Here's where the 80-20 principle blew my mind. Okay, chalkboard trigger warning. This is about to get a little dense, but I promise I'll come to the point. Cool? Cool. You might assume that if there's an average exercise, something that improves your playing a little bit, but which isn't earth shattering, that most things would cluster around that average and there'd be a gradual drop off in utility as you got to the extremes. This is called a normal distribution. Here's a handy graph. It's the classic bell curve. Things like average height follow the bell curve. You've got a lot of people pretty close to average height, and the farther away you get from the average, the more the numbers drop off. But what Vilfredo Pareto and others proposed was that some things are distributed very differently. In some systems, the vast majority of inputs have effects that are small to nil, while a tiny minority have effects that are geometrically larger than the rest. This is the Pareto, or power law, distribution. The 80-20 bit comes from Pareto's observations in nature. In pea crops, 20% of the plants were responsible for 80% of the yield. In economics, Pareto observed that roughly 80% of the wealth was concentrated amongst roughly 20% of the population. Okay, but so what? Well, those distributions are so different that the effect of one to the other is night and day. To illustrate just how different the 80-20 distribution is from the standard bell curve, if height followed a Pareto distribution, most people would only be a few inches tall 
and a tiny fraction of the population would be hundreds of feet tall. So important takeaway, Pareto distributions don't describe all systems, and it's important to distinguish which ones they do describe. If you're still awake and with me, a return to the point. In drum practice, if practice follows a normal distribution, that means that slight changes in what you're practicing will result in slight changes in utility. But the vast majority of things you could be doing are pretty close to average utility. But if it follows a Pareto or 80-20 distribution, that means that greater than 80% of your output could be due to 20% or fewer of your inputs. And further, that shifting from one of the activities on the tail of the distribution, which is that flat part, to one on the hockey stick, which is the vertical part, could make a night and day difference in how quickly you improve. So, which is it? Time for a disclaimer. I want to be super careful when I speak about real science to caveat what I'm sort of guessing about and what I know for sure. Can we tell with absolute certainty whether drum practice does or doesn't follow a Pareto distribution? Probably not. In order to do that, you'd probably need a statistically significant double-blind study with a huge cohort. What I'll do instead is offer anecdotal evidence from my own experience that strongly influences my opinion, then leave you to draw your own conclusions. Cool? Okay, anecdote number two. For a long time, as I mentioned above, I wasn't improving very quickly, even after music school. The period I described in my getting gigs lesson, in which I was frustrated with my ability to get and keep gigs, also not so coincidentally dovetailed with this period in my playing when I now realize I was plateauing in my playing. Around that time, I was geeking out on the greats, the same as everybody else was. Eric, Mark, Keith, Nate, Ari, Kendrick, then later on, Marcus. I was trying to figure out what made their playing so special, and at the time, I was convinced it was chops. During that time, I had what you might describe as a typical practice routine. This will sound familiar if you've read any of my emails. Hour of the same warm-ups every day. Hour of coordination exercises out of books. Then, if I still had steam and wasn't out of time, some time improvising, or trying to synthesize all that info. I'd play gigs, and sometimes they felt great, others not so much. But when I'd listen to the recordings, the time and feel was always a surprise. Then one YouTube video was a plot twist for me. Know how once a buddy points out that the negative space in the FedEx logo makes an arrow, you can't unsee it? Well, this was like that. Here's the video. It's my friend Daisuke playing with a drummer called Anthony Lee. Anthony Lee isn't playing anything particularly choppy. And that's the point. But listen to what he does do. The time is solid. Within big phrases, but also between 1 16th and the next. He's together with himself, so that if you took the band away, he'd still sound great as an individual. By contrast, in my recordings of the period, if you took the band away, I'd sound like a mess. More on the implications of this in a minute, but why was it Anthony Lee and not any of the myriad other drummers I was following at the time that finally burst my bubble? I think it's precisely because he wasn't hiding behind chops or licks. It was the perfect controlled experiment. If you take chops out of the equation, are good drummers still better than mediocre ones? It turned out, yes. Of course, those famous drummers I followed were doing the same thing Anthony Lee was. Consistent time on both the macro and micro level, and playing together with themselves. But they were also doing a lot of other stuff that interfered with the signal. Bill Stewart has a lilting feel that can obscure how precise his time is. Eric Harlan plays choppy, so that takes her attention away from how great his time is. And Marcus is the quintessential exception that proves the rule. 
His time and feel is so strong that he can play broken for most of a tune with an implied meter every few bars, and it still feels great. How does this relate to Pareto? It became my hypothesis that most of what I was practicing, if not irrelevant, was essentially window dressing when it came to the goal of emulating my heroes. And the more energy I focused trying to encapsulate what they all had, but what Anthony Lee exemplified so perfectly, the faster I would reach my goal. Basically, I theorized that the Anthony Lee sh was the 80-20 of how to get from mediocre to decent in as little time as possible. What happened over the ensuing few years was an extremely long, drawn-out inflection point. Beginning sometime last year, I finally stopped being surprised by my time and feel on recordings. It's a work in progress as I work to go deeper and deeper, gradually ferreting out all the spots that still give me trouble. Let's touch quickly on Anders Ericsson and deliberate practice. In the talent episode, I mentioned that Gladwell's primary takeaway from Ericsson was the 10,000 hour rule. And I pointed out some of the pitfalls of being too quick to extrapolate to the nature-nurture debate. What if all of Ericsson's subjects were already talented, etc.? But Ericsson himself pointed out that 10,000 hours did not alone a world-class performer make. Inherited talent aside, people, according to Ericsson, need deliberate practice to reach a world-class level. What's deliberate practice? As James Clear paraphrases Erickson, deliberate practice refers to a special type of practice that is purposeful and systematic. While regular practice might include mindless repetitions, deliberate practice requires focused attention and is conducted with the specific goal of improving performance. Erickson and thinkers like Charles Duhigg and Daniel Coyle take it a step further. It requires a coach. So let's take another look at what I was doing before my breakthrough. Practicing the same warm-ups every day and practicing stuff from books pretty arbitrarily. Not to product plug, but product plug. In my practice course, I get into specifics about this. But suffice it to say, what I was practicing was not very focused or specific. It wasn't focused because it was arbitrary rather than directed at a single goal. Compare that to post-breakthrough. Doggedly focused on the goal of getting the Anthony Lee vibe into my playing. And constantly testing myself through recording mainly to see how close I was getting to the goal. To circle around to the final question, is the difference between deliberate practice and arbitrary practice incremental and linear, like those standard distribution curves, or dramatic and geometric, like those power law hockey sticks? Well, you know what I named my fucking website, so you know where I fall on this question. I strongly believe there's an 80-20 effect to deliberate practice. When I started to practice in a specific goal-directed way, I started to improve much more quickly. Many of the folks I'd overhear through the walls of our shared practice studios stayed the same. Sure, it could have been coincidence, or the cumulative effect of all those years I'd put in finally kicking in. But my opinion is that it's not, and that's why my channel is so named. Hope you've enjoyed this one, guys, and now it's time for a little rampant commercialism. You know how a lot of those information YouTube channels you watch, like Wendover Productions or Half as Interesting, are sponsored by things like Brilliant.org or The Great Courses Plus, and they call those out at the end of the lesson? Well, we're kind of like that, except we're sponsored by the courses that I built. And if you found this lesson interesting, one course you might find interesting is my course called The Practice Course, which delves way deeper into all of the principles of deliberate practice and actually gives you guys a system to follow. We only open that up a few times a year, and the way to hear about it is to be on my mailing list. And if you want to get on my mailing list and get a completely free gateway drug that will ease you into some of my more structured premium instruction, go ahead and click on the link below the player and enter your email in on the next page. And I'll send you three completely free videos that'll make you playing better in the next three weeks than it's gotten in the last six months. Hope you guys enjoyed this one. See you back next week.